Hello, my name is Rohit Talwa and I'm a global futurist. I work with organizations, governments and individuals around the world to help them think about the developments, the advances in science and technology and the new ideas that could shape the future and how we can prepare for them, how we can take advantage of them, how we fund those developments and how we make sure that they serve humanity uh, to best effect. And I'm gonna draw on some of those insights to look at how do we do the same with the longevity marketplace. Now, what we know is that the dialogue today is really quite tightly held amongst the experts in the community and the enthusiasts and the people who are starting to take the treatment. But we know that we want to extend that to a much broader audience. So the question is, how do we do that? And particularly in the current context where we know that there are multiple forces already at play, economic, political, social, scientific, and now the pandemic has added an extra layer. It's put pressure on government budgets. It's put pressure on a lot of individuals' finances. But it's also raised the issue of uh, how do we deal with future pandemics? We've seen in this one that the elderly in particular have been most affected. And a number of governments are beginning to understand that if we can treat aging as a disease and improve the resilience of older people, then it might dramatically reduce the cost of treatment going forward for any future pandemic. And it might allow those people to stay active in society rather than having to isolate. So the challenge now is to think about, well, how might the next few years play out and what would our strategy be under any of the possible scenarios that might play out, uh, particularly in relation to the access to funding, the willingness for investors to play in the sector and the take up amongst society. So let me talk you through three scenarios. And, and the trick is not to choose a scenario you like best, but to think about what your strategy would be under any one of these scenarios. The first is one where we effectively don't eradicate the pandemic fully until around 2025. We don't get full global vaccination until then. And we have a very hesitant recovery in some countries, a successful in one in others, but many really struggling to pull out of this until 2024, 2025. The second scenario is where many see we are now, where we keep having selective restrictions and a very choppy recovery in many recovery in many countries where we come out of any downturn and we drop back in. Uh, in this scenario, we might be able to see the, the pandemic being eradicated by the end of 2023, but really taking again till 2023, 2024, till we see a full global recovery. The most optimistic scenario is one where we really put our act together in order to get the global infrastructures in place to deliver vaccination everywhere in the world by the end of 2022. And governments put a very strong focus on regenerating the economy through encouraging investment and through direct investment in new sectors, uh, green technology sectors, new health sectors, and in retraining people to take up jobs in those sectors. So we're giving the economy a real boost with a future focus. So how would you deal with any of those scenarios? What would your strategy be? How would it change from scenario to scenario? And what we know is that the current situation has really raised the focus on how do we deliver on a broader sustainability agenda? So the question becomes, what role can we play in helping address any of these issues? What role can the science we're developing here play in helping to address these things, either as a direct impact or a secondary one. We also know that we're part of an exponential explosion in science and technology across a range of fields. And the question is, how do we tap into that and make people aware that this is just another development that could bring an exponential advance in terms of the quality of human life going forwards? We're also part of a broader digital agenda. We know that seven of the eight largest companies after Saudi oil are technology companies with deeper and deeper roots into everything that goes on. Last year, Amazon, Microsoft, and Apple all crossed the trillion dollar threshold. This year, Apple crossed the $2 trillion threshold. Now to put these numbers in context, 
if you added together all these companies, we still wouldn't get one Amazon or one Microsoft or one Apple. That just shows how powerful these companies are becoming. And what we see is their tentacles extending. Google already have a play in the life extension field. Others are getting involved. And the question starts to become how interested are these players today? How might they become interested in the future? What kind of partnerships might we develop within, with them? Would they be interested in being investors? But really, how are we framing ourselves to, to play with these major behemoths uh, who are going to be dominant forces in the economy for some time to come? We also know that there are other sectors that are getting very interested in what they can do in adjacent fields in healthcare in its broader sense. So again, what is our strategy for getting alongside these players? Who do we think we could work with ethically? Who's outside our... our uh, and how, what different relationships might we be able to form with them? But what's our radar looking like? Who's on our non-executive board? Who's on our advisory board that could help make those introductions? At the same time, we know we have to get that conversation going in broader society. But right now, much of the language we talk in, many of the things we talk about from life extension and cryogenics to AI, it feels outside their domain of understanding. So what can we do to demystify the language and make it more accessible? I think if you look at what the AI sector has done, they're, they're starting to do a better and better job. The University of Helsinki has this uh, set of six modules called the elements of AI that really demystify it and make it accessible for anyone across the planet to start to understand what AI is all about. And it's really advancing the dialogue in many places. We also know that the more popular uh, this field becomes, the more at risk it is to being uh, distorted by the conspiracy theorists. We've seen that happen with the vaccines. We've seen that happen with the whole notion of COVID-19. And I think we have to be very mindful that this could happen with life extension. And therefore, we need to be thinking now about how are we going to counter that? So really, we can see a few factors at play here. And, and what it really means is we've got to learn to dance on a bigger stage. We've got to learn some routines that will help us stand out on the dance floor of 2021 and beyond. Some of the ways we can do that. The first is around how we raise investment. This is about tapping into the broadest range of networks, getting to wider and wider ranges of angel investors who have contacts into the vital sectors we need to reach but who can also help introduce us to the second and third tier funders. But it also means getting alongside the corporate venturers who might wanna play in this space and starting to uh, educate the institutional investors, the sovereign wealth funds to help them understand just the sheer potential and scale this industry could reach and how they need to have it on their radar and start learning about it now before they start investing hundreds of millions or even billions of dollars in it. In it in the coming years. It also means whether we like it or not, the influence of community are very important. Many of them have millions or more of followers who if we can get them talking about life extension in either a passionate way or an informed way, they can help take that message out in a way that most of us don't have the resources to do or maybe even the know-how to do. At the same time, we also need to be tackling the policy agenda really making policy makers aware of what the possibilities are, helping them think about how you regulate in this environment and really helping them bake this into their one to 20 year roadmaps for health and societal improvement. Which also means thinking about how we work directly with the healthcare providers themselves, helping them understand how these treatments could be part of the portfolio of what they offer their patients or customers uh, helping them think about the funding mechanisms and uh, approaches to charging for these treatments, which vary quite dramatically in price, but also helping them think about the kinds of issues that might pre present when treatments go wrong. And they're likely to be presenting long before some of these healthcare providers have actually started doing this themselves. So how do we help them understand what's going on here so they can offer a good service, whether they're in privately or publicly funded environment. This is also gonna have a major impact on all sorts of environments in which people operate, whether it's broader society, whether it's the workplace or education. 
if we're having people potentially being able to work into their 70s, 80s or 90s and beyond, that changes the dynamics of workplaces. It changes their relationships. It has an impact on the kind of language you use, the information, knowledge and experience base we're drawing on. And so it's going to have some big impacts on all sorts of aspects of this. And again, we need to be thinking about that, communicating about that and helping those who might be on the receiving end think about how they build this into their organizational models, their learning models and their societal engagement models. We also need to think about the second and third order effects going beyond the direct benefits or implications to what could happen next. And a very good example of this is, is what you see on the screen. This is the Dermot Smart Mattress that has sensors embedded in it to help you sleep better by providing you with the information on what seemed to be the best time for you to go to bed, the best position to lie in. But what's really interesting is they don't market it as much on that basis. They market it on the basis that because the information goes to your mobile phone, you can find out if someone is having fun in your bed while you're out at work. Now, whilst that might be, seem funny, it also has an implication for the vendors because they might need to start thinking about building divorce insurance into the pricing of their products. And the same way as players in this field, we might start to need to start thinking about what are the things we need to build into our pricing? Do we need to start thinking about very different models for pricing? For example, securitizing this. So if we can extend someone's lifespan by 20 or 30 years and their productive lifespan, but we have a relatively expensive treatment, well, could we provide that to them on the basis that they then give us a fraction of their earnings for the, the proportion of the, their working life that we've extended? in order to offset the cost of providing it to them. It opens up all sorts of possibilities, but we need to be thinking about that now in order to provide those options when we go to market. We also have to recognize there is the potential for people using these treatments uh, for malicious intent and just thinking about all of the different ways in which they could be, be used. Part of that means thinking about education and, and more broadly, how are we going to educate all of those different stakeholder groups, make them aware, engage their interests and have them understand what these treatments are, how they work, what the benefits are, what the potential risks are, and then having them have enough insight, information, knowledge to be able to have informed debate at different levels in society about whether they want it, about how you fund it, and about how you deal with the consequences of any side effects. This also means the industry really starting to develop very rigorous professional ethical standards like any other field of medicine and building up that body of knowledge and that body of professional practice that really uh, helps the industry stand out and build trust. So, this is a fairly rapid run through some of those different factors that I think play into how we help this industry mature, commercialize and stand out in a professional and ethical manner in a world where science isn't always respected. So I hope that's helped you think about some of the steps you might need to take in order to take the debate to the next level and raise the scale of the marketplace that we're accessing. Now to help you think about these kinds of developments and other fields of science and technology and how they're moving and what they could mid for society, uh, we're very happy to offer you a free one year subscription to our newsletter. Just go to our website, as you can see on the screen, select the Futurescapes newsletter and then enter code RTNews at checkout and you'll be registered for a free one year electronic distribution of the newsletter. So I hope this session has been of interest and value and I look forward to hearing more of the sessions in the conference. And with that, I will hand you back to the organizers. Thank you.